Genesis chapter 30. I want to thank Randy for filling in last week. I learned so much about Randy. And, uh, and I will make sure that if I ever sneak up behind Shauna to give her a kiss um, in a public place, then I'll make sure it's her first. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go online and watch the video. As his face turns red. No. Um, so. He did a great job last week uh, getting us into this story in Genesis chapter 29. As, as he said last week, it's going to get crazier. And it's so true because uh, chapter 30, it gets a little crazy. And some of you guys must, might have seen my uh, Facebook post. I think I've got the slide there, Elijah. Is it on there, the dysfunctional family one? Is it on there? Uh, dysfunctional family feud is what we're going to be looking at this week as we look at Jacob's dysfunctional family. Um, it, it's going to be pretty crazy. Um, Jacob is learning the biblical lesson, you reap what you sow. Jacob deceived his father and his brother, and now, as we see last week, as we saw last week, Uncle Laban has deceived and tricked and used Jacob for his own gain. He's getting, he's reaping what he sowed. Jacob dressed up in his brother's clothes. He put on those goat skin, you remember that? He put on the goat skin, like, who feels like a goat? Like that, the guy must have been, oh my goodness. And he, and, he, and he tricked his father to get the blessing. The blessing that God had already promised to Jacob. That's the kicker. Jacob would have gotten it no matter what. But Jacob thought, well, I'm just going to sneak in here. And, you know, his mom's advice, I'm going to go in and get the blessing. But if he had just waited, God would have given it to him. And we saw last week how Laban and Jacob made a deal for seven years, he would work for Rachel. Um, that's a long time. Uh, if my father-in-law had said, you know, I remember the day he said to me, I, you know, I give you permission to marry uh, my daughter. I hadn't asked. He just offered. Um, if he had said, in seven years, I would have been like, well, see you later, buddy. <laughs> seven years. And you have to come work for me. I'd be like, no, I don't think so. But uh, he says, okay, he wants to marry Rachel. So he says he agrees to seven years. He works for him seven years, and he ends up being tricked by Laban, wakes up the next morning, and he's married Leah, the wrong girl, the older sister. And then, I don't understand what he was doing. You'd think he would, you know, quit why the quitting's good, you know. He'd just make, decide that it's time to, you know. He says, okay, I'll do another seven years for Rachel. So he does another seven years to marry Rachel. And um, it's just a mess. It's just a mess here. Jacob is learning, like I said, the biblical truth that we reap what we sow. If, we, if he had trusted in Jesus, if we trust in Jesus, for our, uh, Jesus, our sins are forgiven. But there's still consequences in this life for our actions. And, that, and that's the thing that we have to realize. There's still consequences. When we say, why are these things, these things happening to me? There's still consequences for our actions. And so he's reaping what he has sown. And Jacob's now, now living in God's school of difficulties to teach him and to grow him. God is now trying to teach Jacob how to be that man that he wants him to be. This really shows God's grace and mercy that even in my disobedience, even my disobedience does not derail the plan of God for my life. That's such a blessing. That even in my disobedience, it does not derail God's plan for my life. That should really excite you. That should be like, oh, thank you. Because sometimes we look and we look at our past and say, well, I'm hooped. You know, I've gone too far. This is, I'm never going to get anywhere. I've messed up too much. God has a plan and he's going to continue to work even through our messes. But it does affect how I experience God's plan for my life. I can experience it like Jacob through trials and consequences or I can experience it through letting the Lord guide me and follow his plan. So most of us have made messes and we've had to deal with those messes. So what's the trick? Learn from your mistakes. Trust the Lord the next time that thing comes up. Don't go, oh, I'm going to do the same thing. Here we're going to see that Jacob is doing the same thing that his father did. 
and his wives are going to do the same thing that Sarah did. They're going to repeat the same mistakes. So it's important, I think, and, and, and I, I've seen this happen so many times, it's ex- important for us to share with our kids our mistakes and what we learn from them. It doesn't always protect them from doing the same thing because you know how we are, right? Well, that was you. I can take that. Whatever. But it's important that we teach them and show them the things that we've learned so that they can grow and we can say, you know what? I did that. I made the decision and this is the consequences that followed me for years afterwards. Don't make the same mistake. Because when they're in that heat of whatever, whenever something's happening, they might go, well, you know what? I'm going to make the different decision. I'm going to go in a different direction than they did. It's important that we do that. Disobedient in, geez, disobedience in a child of God's life invites the discipline of God. Ugh, ouch. God chastens those he loves. So if he's giving you a swat on the behind, that's a good thing. It means he loves you. It means you're, he's your ch- child, that you're his child. And it's good for us, but it should be building us and making us stronger, not making us run away. It should be building us up. Jacob's scheming and disobedience has led him to this mess he lives in right now. He's in chaos. He's in a mess. It's, it, it's, it's just made such a mess of his life, but God is still going to move through his mess. That's the part that blows me away. Remember as we're going through this, this is one of the fathers of the faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the, the Jews would walk around and say, I'm the child of Jacob. You go, is that something you really want to tell people? Have you read what it says? Have you read the story? But it shows us that God worked even through this entire mess. Jacob's scheming and disobedience has led him to this mess he lives in right now. God is going to use these circumstances to change Jacob from the heel catcher and schemer he is to a man who is governed by God. He is going to change Jacob. He's going to teach Jacob through these things. Jacob is slowly going to wake up to the reality of what the Lord is doing. So last, uh, last week, as you came to the end of cha- uh, chapter 29, you saw Jacob married to both Leah and Rachel. Now let me say this because it's important. The Bible does not condone polygamy. Marriage is to be between one man and one woman. That's what the Bible teaches us. The Bible simply records for us the stories of these people and their lives, both good and bad. He doesn't condone it. The Bible is like, um, in a lot of cases, it's like a newspaper. You wouldn't pick up the newspaper, if you get a newspaper, um, our newspapers in town are kind of advertising, but you wouldn't get a, a paper that says, you know, reports on a murder and go down here and say, how dare you, you murderers. You're a bunch of murder. You condone murder because you report on murder. It's like, no, they're saying, no, we're just telling you the facts. And the Bible is telling us the facts. There is polygamy that happened, but it's not good. And we're going to see that it's not good because we're going to see the mess that it creates. It's not a happy situation. It's a mess. And the reason I want to say this is because today in our world and in our area, we all know from, you know, Creston area, the the Bountiful and the stuff that goes on there, there is a battle going on for, for the permission for polygamy, which is just part of the sickness of our world right now. It's not healthy, it's not right, and it's damaging, and it's not good. And so I just encourage you, there's TV shows out there, there's all this stuff out there now. Don't watch it. Don't plug into it. It's just trying to convince you that it's okay. It's not okay. It's not a happy situation. We're going to see that right now. It does not make for a happy situation. The Bible teaches us in Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will, also, will, will be also. We can only put our treasure in one place at one time. That's important for us to understand. In Luke 16, verse 13, it says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. It is so important for us to understand this. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. 
Men, your treasure can only be with your wife. Ladies, your treasure can only be with your husband. And I'm not just talking about physical stuff. I'm talking about emotionally. Be careful that you're not pouring your treasure into another lady or man. This is how it starts. By pouring your treasure, your emotions, your dreams, your desires into someone else other than your spouse. Someone at work, someone you bump into, just a friend, and you start sharing with them and whatever, and you begin the slippery slope. It's so important because then what happens is you go home and your spouse does everything wrong. Your spouse makes a mess. They don't cook things right. They don't do their hair right. They don't do anything right. And you start getting dis disgruntled and upset. And you don't even realize it because you've taken your treasure and you've placed it somewhere else. It's so important. This is so important even in the church. That's why oftentimes we say, men, you pray with men. Women, you pray with women. Why? Because prayer binds us together. It knits us together emotionally and spiritually. So if you're going off and praying with someone from the opposite sex over and over again each week and spending time praying about your needs, it's binding you closer together. And if you're not doing that with your spouse, what are you doing? You're pulling away from them and binding with someone else. And that's dangerous. That's how affairs and all kinds of junk happens. It's so important. We need to be careful who we're pouring our treasure. And I just want to point that out because it's, it's something that we need to know and it's something we need to pass on. Because in our world today, we hear nothing about, we hear divorce, 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 splitting up, kids and blah, the big mess. We need to say, and, and, we, and I've said this to young couples when they're about to get married, you guys need to be bound together. You need to put your friends aside. And they go, what? I don't think so. And they go, your spouse is number one. There isn't some other girl that you go talk to, guys. And girls, there is no other guy that you go talk to. I've heard girls say, but he's my friend. I've had him friends for years. It's like, no. We are designed to couple. And if you start doing that, what's going to happen? You're going to decouple and then couple and create a mess. Look around you. So it's important that we grab onto this and hold onto it tightly. It's so important. That's why oftentimes I will, if a lady asks me to pray for them, I'll grab another lady to stand next to us or another guy and someone else to come. This is so important that, you, that it's a group thing and that it's not one-on-one. -on -one. It's important that we do this. It's, it's so important. So Jacob finds himself in this mess, stuck between two women. And, and as we saw last week, the baby battle begins. This is the baby battle, okay? There's a battle raging. So Genesis 30, verse 1, Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Can you imagine? Give me children! She's, he's kind of like, Well, it's not really my problem. I'm the other one's producing. Like, I'm obviously able to do the things that I need to do. And Jacob's, Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, I, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? He's like, I, I can't, I, it's not me. He's, I'm not God. What do you want me? It's obvious that there's not a problem here. Leah has already given Jacob four sons at this time. Hoping all the while, and we saw that last week, hoping all the while that each of those sons would draw her closer to her husband. But as we saw last week, um, Jacob loved Rachel, and Leah was unloved. And we saw that as, as she gave birth to each one of those sons, she's like, surely now my husband will love me. Rachel was barren and growing more envious with each child being born. Rachel had Jacob's love and attention, but Leah was able to give Jacob something that she couldn't. And it was creating a battle. It was creating envy. She demands that Jacob give her a baby like he really had some choice in the matter. Like he could really do anything about it. Verse 3, it says, So she said, Here is my maid, Billah. Go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have, a, have children by her. 
Then she gave him Bil, uh, Bilhah, her maid, as, as wife, and Jacob went into her, and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Oh, here we go again. Elijah, can you mute the guitar? I think it's, yeah. Here we go again. We're going again. We've heard this story before. We need to have some babies, so let's bring someone else into the mix. No. It's, that's not how it's going. Instead of waiting and trusting in God's hand to move, she begins to scheme. So she gives Bilhah to Jacob. Now, when they say that she gave Bilhah to her maid as wife, it does not mean that Jacob married her. It meant that he treated her like a wife. He did with her like he would a wife. He went in and had a child with her. She was being used as a surrogate mother. This baby would be Rachel's, would be listed as Rachel's child. And so she was being a surrogate mother. And when you look at it in, in, um, in history, this was a common practice. We talked about it with Abraham and Sarah. They would um, give birth literally uh, sitting on the, uh, the mother who couldn't give birth. The, the uh, surrogate mother would sit on her lap and the baby would be born and they would say it's hers now. And it was a weird thing, but it was basically surrogate motherhood. And uh, Donald Barnhouse said, can a woman get so low that she will hit her sister over the head with a baby. And that's literally what we're seeing here. She has sunk so low that she's like, well, I can't have a kid. I'll get someone else to have a kid for me. And then I can say to my sister, oh, yeah? No, I got a kid. <laughs> it's literally what she does. Rachel said, God has judged my case. And he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Did God judge her case and give her a son? No. This is one of those cases where God's like, don't drag me into this. I didn't do anything. You're the one who schemed up the plan and gave your, your servant girl. Like, what are you doing? Don't drag me into this. Drags, drags her in, and that's why I, I, when I read that quote the other day, can a woman get so low that she will hit her sister over the head with a baby. I thought, huh, my goodness, this is a baby battle. They're going to be baby battling throughout this entire chapter. It says, and so it says here in verse 7, And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestling I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. She, so she called his name Naphtali. Oh, I've wrestled with her, but now I've got two babies. <laughs> battle goes on. Verse 9, it says, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. So she goes, oh yeah? I've got a servant girl too. We can both play that game. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, a troop comes, so she called his name Gad. It's like, oh yeah? You got two? I got a whole gaggle. I got a whole troop. I got it more than you. All right, we're winning. We're ahead of the game. This is just silly. Leah looks at her sister and says, hey, Rachel, I think that makes another for me. What are you going to do? Yeah, ching, ching. What are you going to do next? And Le Leah's made Zilpah bore a second son, and Leah said, I am happy. For the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Oh, and another. Here's another one. All right, two for two. You got two with your servant girl. I got two with my servant girl. All right, but I'm head of the game already. Now Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. So we read this and we go, what is going on here? He, the son goes out and finds these mandrakes and they're like, please give me the mandrakes. Well, first the question is, what is a mandrake? Uh, in the Hebrew translation, it's love apple. It is a root that um, it causes a cathartic effect 
often used in helping with conception. It is a narcotic that causes all kinds of weird side effects. And so they would use it, and they believed it would help in conception. Um, and so she finds this, and she's like, well, I need that. You don't need that. You're doing fine on your own. I need that. And so they begin to fight over it. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. You give me the mandrakes, you can have Jacob tonight. Can you see this mess? And the kids are being dragged into it too. Kid comes home, hey mom, look, I got you some of those roots you like. She goes, oh, thank you. And then the, then the other mom, the sister, aunt comes in, what a mess, and says, give those to me, I need those. And he's just standing there going, here, they're going to go at it again as they begin fighting and they're battling over these mandrakes. And she says, fine, you can have them. Just a mess. So they trade. So you can imagine. It says, when Jacob came out of the field in the evening, he's working out in the field. He comes back home after working in the field, and Leah went out to meet one of them and said, you must come into me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he's just like, what's for dinner? What's going on? You hired me? And, and, and this shows a little bit about Jacob. He just kind of goes, sure, whatever. It's like, okay. And he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. This should be an encouragement for all of us. Even in the big mess, God still listens and is still moving. We have to understand that in this relationship, Rachel has been getting all the love, the attention, and Leah's just been thrown to the side. She's born children for Jacob and everything. And she is learning something that Rachel is not learning yet. She's learning to call out to God. She's learning to call out to God. She's learning to lean on the Lord and to call out to him. It says God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore a fifth son. It's so important. In chapter 29, it said, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. God saw Leah's pain. God saw Leah's pain, and he blessed her. After having three children with Jacob, hoping that she would receive his attention and love, she has her fifth, and instead of naming him, naming him after her struggle to get her husband, she turns her eyes towards the Lord and names him praise. We looked at that last week, how each child was, was, was talking about the struggle and, and desiring for her husband to dwell with her, to be with her. He called him Levi. And it's like, well, he'll be attached to me. When we realize that's what Levi meant, we realize, oh, we understand it now because we could never get Levi off our legs. Or he was always attached somehow. Now he's too big. He'll just hurt us. But she comes to this child and she says, I'm going to name him praise. She turns her eyes from her problem and turns to the Lord and says, I'll name him praise. And his name was Judah. And in the midst of this messy, dysfunctional family, God uses Leah to bring forth the royal line of Judah from which the Messiah comes through. Leah, who is the forgotten one. Leah is the one that's being treated wrongly. And God uses her to bring the royal line of Judah. It's beautiful how the Lord is working. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Leah mistakes God's grace and favor for payment for her sacrifice. She's praying. She's desiring the Lord answers. And she goes, oh, good. See, I, God's paying me back. I'm having more babies. This is good. Oftentimes, we can do that too. We can mistake God's favor for uh, 
for um, payment for something that we've done. We don't earn God's favor. We don't earn his blessings. He just gives them to us because he loves us. He's not giving them because you've got to throw many gold stars on your star chart. You know, you're in Sunday school or whatever. Huh? Yeah, sorry. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. After she bore, after, after she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Now, in the Middle Eastern world, having a boy was a big thing. Was important because it carried on your line. It meant you had a worker. Um, you had someone who's strong and can do the work. A girl often costs you money and struggles. And so you'd always really want a son. And so it's been said, and I think Randy might have mentioned this last week, it has been said that that it, it, oftentimes they would prepare for a, a woman to give birth and they would have a band and they would be all excited and they'd be like, yay! And, and the midwife would come out and be like, it's a boy! And the band would start up and they would start serving the food and it was a great time. But if they came out and said, it's a girl, they'd all go, pack it up, going home. A little party about here. It was a different time, different things. So I think it's kind of funny here that they mention all of these sons and everything, and then they just go, oh, yeah, and by the way, we had a daughter named Dinah. We'll talk about her later. So after six sons and a daughter, Leah still longs for the love of her husband. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived. And bore a son and and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. The Lord hears Rachel and she has a son of her own. She has a son of her own finally. And it says the Lord hears, which means that she prayed. She prayed. So Leah was learning to call out to the Lord because of unlove. And Rachel now is learning to call unto the Lord because of her barrenness. And she calls out to the Lord and the Lord hears. The Lord is working to teach Jacob to trust in him and also his wives to trust in the Lord as well. He's building this trust and this desire in their life. After looking at this section, we will better understand why Joseph is treated so badly in the upcoming chapters. We have to understand, this is a dysfunctional, messy, messy family. You've got these sons that are born to Leah, sons that are born to the servants. We've got all of these sons that have all come together, and now they're one happy family. Not. Their moms are constantly fighting and battling. Their dad is kind of going, I don't know what's going on. And it's just a mess. And then Joseph's born to Rachel, the one that Jacob loves. What do you think's going to happen? He's spoiled. And the older brothers are like, we're going to... You know, you can see every practical joke. You know, putting the saran wrap over the top of the outhouse. I don't, I don't know what they had back then. <laughs> I don't, but they, have, they don't have saran wrap, so I don't know what they'd use. I guess you can't do those practical jokes. That's no fun. You know, maybe throwing him down the well. I don't know what they did. They did stuff to him. I'm sure they picked on him pretty bad. But we can see that, and we're going to see how this dysfunctional family just makes a mess. This family is a mess, but even in, the, in their mess, God has a plan. For these brothers who are so dysfunctional, this family that's so dysfunctional, they become the 12 tribes of Israel. These are the, these are the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. This is where it all starts. Something to be proud of. When we look at it, we go, wow. God did this to show us something, that he can work with any of us. It doesn't make a difference where we're from. It doesn't make a difference where we've come from or what we've done. 
He can use any of us in his plan. And oftentimes he works in spite of us. He goes, well, I know you're going to be stubborn and whatever, but I'm going to continue to work and eventually you'll figure it out. And when you look at Jacob's life, you can almost see that. God's just like, well, we'll just drag you along until you finally figure it out. Because I have a plan for you and tough luck, you can't mess it up. Here we go. I'm just going to keep going. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and my own country. So now he's had all these sons and he's had this daughter and he kind of goes, okay, things, my family's growing, things are working, it's time that I go home. He remembers that this isn't his land. He remembers that there's a country that God has blessed him with and said, this is yours. And so he says, okay, you know what? It's time that I go home. He says, give me my, my wives and my children from whom I have served you and let me go for you know my service and, uh, which I have done for you. So Jacob's family is growing and now he begins to look and he's like, okay, I gotta go. Just give me my stuff. I need to leave. And Laban said to him, please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, name your wages and I will give it. This is amazing. You gotta understand, this is the father-in-law saying, please stay. That's a, that's a weird thing to happen. You, you, you've blessed me. It's usually, you're driving me nuts. Get out of my house. <laughs> but he says, he says, please stay if, you've, if, if I found favor in your eyes. Remember that Jacob, when he arrived, had nothing. He had a rock. You know, he shows up with his pillow. Ugh. All I got is my pillow. Where should I put it? They're like, put it over there. We'll get you a real one. He's like, he showed up with nothing, running in fear because his brother was trying to kill him. He had ripped off his parents. He's there and, and everybody's just upset with him. And he shows up with nothing. And his uncle says, you know what? You can't just work for me for free. I might as well pay you something. What can we do? I'll give you my daughter. And the whole thing started. And now, 14 years later, Laban is saying, I want you to stay. Why? Not because he married the daughters, but because he was such a good worker that Laban's, uh, his flocks and everything were prospering, and he was not an idiot. He knew that something was going on. He knew that the blessing was coming through Jacob. And he's like, no, you... You can't go anywhere. Now, it says here that I have learned by experience. This word for experience in the Hebrew means by divination or enchantment. Laban had learned through occult practices of the blessings he had received from keeping Jacob around. This is kind of weird. He had learned through divination, through enchantments, that he was being blessed. Now, we've all seen it. We've, you know, you, you watch it on these movies. You got the fortune teller who gives you the fortune. You go in and go, am I going to fall in love? Oh, you're going to find tall, dark, and handsome. And he's going to, oh, oh, you know, it's going to be amazing. Now, give me my $50. You know, I can just see this. They, 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 he goes in to ask them stuff or does his divination or whatever, and they're going, hey, knucklehead, what's the one thing that changed in your life? You got this son-in-law, and he's blessing you. He's obviously the lucky rabbit's foot. Keep him around. And so he, what, however he did it, he got some thing. But you think that he could stop without having to do any divination or enchantment or some kind of weird, you know, stuff. He could just look around and go, huh, wait a second. Since Jacob showed up, everything's kind of tripled. So maybe Jacob has something to do with it, and he's a good worker. I think I should keep him around. Jacob does not, or Laban does not like the idea of letting Jacob go. Jacob has worked for him for 14 years. He's had this blessing in his life for 14 years. And he's like, I, I don't think I can let this guy go. Jacob had become, like I said, his rocky, lucky rabbit's foot. Laban had no interest in the God whom Jacob served, only in the blessing that came from serving him. That's the interesting part. Laban's going to do enchantments. Laban's got other gods. But he doesn't stop for any time to say, well, maybe if I served his God, he would bless me too. Because Laban's only interested in this stuff. We saw that when 
um, Abraham's servant came to get Isaac a wife. Laban wasn't excited until the bling came out. And when the gold came out, that's when he was like, woo! Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, great, that's good. Come on, we love this. You're a great person. Let's, you know, let's do a deal. He's kind of a slippery guy. So Jacob said to him in verse 29, You know how I have served you and how your livestock have been with me. For what you, have before, for what you, for what you had before I came was little, and it, it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now when, when shall I also provide for my own house? You see, Jacob had been working for Laban. He had gotten wives from, La- from, from he had gotten Laban's daughters, but he still didn't have anything himself. He was just working for Laban. So all the stuff that he had belonged to Laban. So he's like, when am I going to get anything for myself? I need to take care of my family. So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, mm, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flocks today, removing from, removing from, there, all, from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled, speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in, in time to come. When the subject of my wages comes before you, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. So Jacob makes a deal with Laban. He says, okay, we'll go through your flocks and we're going to take out everything that's speckled or spotted or off color. Anything that's just not right, we'll take them out and we'll remove them. Now I'm going to take care of your flock. And every speckled or spotted sheep that, come, that is born into your flock that's now just pure, all one color, I get to keep. But everything else is yours. And you can see Laban going, okay, if you remove the speckled ones, we're not going to produce more speckled ones. This is a good deal. He's thinking, yeah, okay. The chances of having too many speckled ones is, you know, in recessive genes in there maybe, but, you know. More likely, if we do the breeding right, I'm going to get all the good ones and you're going to get nothing. And Laban said, oh, that it, that it were according to your word. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white in it and all the brown ones among the lambs and gave them into the hands of his sons. So Laban takes them and he gives them into his hands of his sons. And then he put three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's fox. So they take all these speckled ones and they remove them three days journey away so there's no mixing. There can't be any mixing. And so now you've got this pure flock and now Jacob is left to take care of Laban's flock. Jacob's sons have taken the speckled and and weird looking ones away. And he's stuck with these ones and he's going to take care of them. And so when we we look at this story, we kind of think, wow, what the heck is going on? This is weird. But he goes and he does this. And Laban thinks, what a great deal. What a great deal. I get to keep all the speckled ones that I have now. I remove them, and Jacob's just going to build my flock into this great, mighty flock where they're all going to be the same color because when you're breeding and stuff, they should all be the same, and we should be good. And by removing them, it decreases the chances, like I said, it decreases the chance of having a speckled uh, lamb or, or goat. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut tree, peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the, in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks brought forth uh, streaked, speckled and spotted. We don't quite understand what's going on here. People have tried to figure it out, but we don't get it. We don't understand what he's doing. He's he's making these rods and he's placing them before the sheep. When the sheep come to drink, they go into heat and they produce these speckled or spotted lambs. Jacob was an expert herdsman. Now, back then, closer to creation, man was smarter. We've actually become dumber despite what we think we're dumber because we can't even remember phone numbers without our phones anymore you know we are you know we look at the pyramids go you could nobody could build that it's like somebody built it 
We look at all the things that are ancient and we go, how in the world did they do this? It's like they figured it out. You know, they say when you look at the Temple Mount and different areas that were built in, in uh, Jerusalem and you look at how these giant stones that are sizes of cars or bigger and they're cut so perfectly that they fit and you can't even shove a piece of paper between them. And they did it without laser levels and, and all of our machines. They cut those by hand. I'm sorry, they were smarter. So maybe he knew something that we don't. He was an expert at animal husbandry. But despite Jacob's method, God, um, God showed him and he prepared him. He, he, he blessed him, he prospered him because he said he would. God said, I will prosper you. Whatever you do, I will prosper you. And so he said what he was going to do. And in chapter 31, it tells us that the Lord spoke to Jacob, telling him what to do. So this is where it always helps to read ahead. In, ch in chapter 31 of Genesis here, verse 10, it says, And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived, that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which, I, which leapt upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob... And I said, I am, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streak speckled and gray spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. The Lord was showing him in a dream, this is what we're going to do. You're going to get all the speckled and streaked ones. Now it says here that the rams, are the, or the, um, the rams that came and leapt upon them were streaked and spotted. Well, we know that they just cleared all of the streaked and spotted ones out. So the Lord's showing him that the ones that are going to come and breed, because every time a speckled one came into the herd, Jacob removed it and put it into his flock and kept Laban's flock pure. And as it went, his flock kept getting bigger as he was removing all these lambs. And Laban's flock became smaller and weaker. And he kept doing it. The Lord showed him somehow that these, these rams that were coming in had in them some genetic whatever to make streaked and spe speckled stuff. So the Lord did it, and it's amazing how the Lord works in our lives, how he, he does amazing work. And I think what it teaches us is that we just need to be faithful and continue to work and be the best employees that we can be, and God will bless us because he said he would. He's going to take care of us because he said he would. Our boss may be a sneaking, conniving little guy, but we just faithfully serve and trust that the Lord is going to take care of us. And he will work. He will do work. So it says here, Then um, uh, Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked, and, uh, or sorry, the streaked, and all the brown in the flock, uh, sorry, and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, uh, whenever the strong livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feeble were Laban's and the strong Jacob's. So here we see this, how the Lord is working. He puts, when the, when the flocks are strong, when the, the flocks are strong, he puts the rods in and they produce streaked and speckled, strong ones, and he puts those in his flock. When the feeble ones came up to drink, he goes, oh, pull those out. Laban can keep those ones. All right, Laban, you get the weak and gimpy ones and I'll take the strong ones. And you can imagine, and we're gonna see next week, Laban's not impressed. As time goes on, Laban and his sons start going, wait a second, this is not working out for us. His flock's growing like crazy. He's got this strong, amazing flock, and our flock's actually getting worse. It's like, this is, we got to get rid of him. And this is one way that the Lord is saying, okay, Jacob, it's time to go. It's time to move on. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. So Jacob goes in this chapter from having nothing to having large flocks, from having servants, because he has the flocks, he has the money to have servants now, and he has camels and donkeys. His little family and his little camp is growing. God can work even in the impossible situations. When all odds are against you, he can work. And we have to remember that. Sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the world 
when it's screaming at us and we don't realize and we, we, we forget or we doubt. God can overcome anything. He's bigger than any problem that sits before us. It is so amazing to see God's hand of promise moving, directing in the midst of this mess. Everything is a mess, and God's like, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. Jacob's in the land he's not supposed to be in. Jacob still has a brother who's going to try to kill him. You know, everything in Jacob's life is a mess. He married the wrong girl, and then he married his, the girl he wanted, and then she turned out to be, you know, crazy. And it's just like, what a mess. They're both fighting constantly. He's got a bunch of kids from a bunch of different people. It's just a mess. His life is a mess, and God's like, no, I'm still going to take care of you. And I'm still going to bless, and I'm still going to work. It's amazing to see God's hand of promise moving. We have to remember that God has promised certain things to us. And we have to hold on to those things. Jacob was a hor horrible son. He lied to his father and his brother. He was just horrible. Jacob was a horrible husband. He should have just stopped and stuck with Leah. Can you imagine what that did to Leah when he got up and said, I don't want her. I'll work for another seven years for the other one. How would they ripped her apart? He was caught up in polygamy, a big mess. His whole life was a mess. But through it all, God is working on softening this man's heart and changing him from a heel catcher, a schemer, into a man governed by God. God is going to change this man. And he can change each and every one of us. Despite what mess and things that we've done, he can change us and renew us and do a work in our lives. It's amazing. And no matter what he did, God's blessings were still there. That's the thing. Not because he earned them, because God, but because God promised he would take care of him. God promised he would take care of him. Jacob continued to mess up, and God's like, Oh, Jacob, I'm just going to keep taking care of you. I'm going to still keep blessing you. <sighs> We're going to see this as he gets to the climax where they actually, he actually wrestles with God. God actually has to like wrestle him to get it through his thick skull. Yeah, he's got to take him down. He's got to take him down, pop his, his hip out. God has made you promises in his word. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will see you through the difficult times. He will send you a comforter who will come alongside and comfort you and guide you. He has made so many promises. He promised that he's coming back. That means he is coming back. And we're to be ready and waiting. We need to hold on to those promises no matter what life throws us. We hold on to them and we continue to walk with them and be strengthened and blessed. Don't let your, your past hold you down. That's the one thing I think Jacob was really good at. He seemed oblivious. I would be like, you know what, forget it, whatever. I'll work for Laban for the rest of my life. I got these two wives complaining and whining all the time. I got these kids running around and they're just out of control. I just give up. But he continued and he held on to the promises of God. So we can't let our past hold us back. We need to say, okay, Lord, I want to see your promises laid out in my life. I want to learn from my mistakes. I want to grow. I want to be made stronger and see you work. It's, good. it's just going to get crazier and more exciting as we continue through this dysfunctional story. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your promises. Lord, how you bless and how you guide, how you direct us, Lord, each day. I pray, Lord God, that you would be working in our lives, that we would hear your voice and that we'd be strengthened, that we'd be built up, Lord God. I pray for each and every one, Lord, that... Now, we all come from different walks of life, different messes. <laughs> I think all of us could say we have dysfunctional families in one way or another. And Lord, we know that you are working and you have a plan for our lives. And we just desire to see your plan roll out before us. We desire to live according to your will, not ours. And that you would just be working, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.